Hey, just a quick reminder that there are spoilers in this video. There are spoilers. Did you hear me? Do you, do you, un do you understand? There's, there's spoilers. There are spoilers ahead. Please leave if you don't like being spoiled. Oh, you've already listened to all my audiobooks and subscribed to get me closer to 10,000 subscribers? Oh, fantastic. Please proceed. What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another episode of... I'm gonna go out on the limb. No pun intended. Actually, that pun was fully intended, and it's not even that funny. Today I have a shorter video for you, or at least a video shorter than yesterday's video on the Peter Kit. See, I was randomly thinking about this story, and something seemed very out of place. So if you want a summary of the story, then go back to that video, uh, and I explain the story as well as the theories that come with it. After all of that explaining, after all of the theorising, about why the hand at the back of the throat that eh, wasn't real, uh, or why the pizza wasn't actually made of Marley, uh, one question was still lurking in my mind. How the hell did Marley survive that fool? How the hell did she pull off such a convincing prank? Uh, and, and how did she manage to be absolutely fine after all of that? I mentioned this in the other video briefly, the fact that Peyton fell off of her roof and broke several limbs, while, uh, while Marley fell off a really, really high place in a factory and was absolutely okay afterwards. That was a joke at first, but now that I think about it, it's actually a good point to, to properly point out. Peyton said it looked like she fell straight into the vat, and if she didn't, she would have broken bones. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to display a theory to you that could be completely wrong, <laughs> because after all, I'm going out on a limb. <laughs> See what I did there? Now I know I'm going to be told a lot in the comments, uh, but I swear that this this might be something. Let's remind ourselves of who Marley actually is. She's a pushy and outgoing girl who makes Peyton take home economics, uh, and, and she's also really bored by the class. She's a popular kid at school, uh, and now we also know that she's a prankster. She also spent the first quarter of the book trying to get this with this guy called Sean. Um, but yeah. Anyway, let's read this extract from the end of the story. Marley stood on the porch, waiting for the door to open. Being missing had been kind of fun. No school, no responsibilities, but hiding out in the pizza factory had started to get old. She missed her boyfriend, missed regular meals, and missed sleeping in her own bed. She had gone to see her boyfriend first, and now she was going to let Peyton know she was okay. Those visits were the first two phases of becoming unmissing. Then she would go back home for the required tearful reunion with her parents. Is it just me or is something off? Is it just me or did she not have a boyfriend before any of this happened? That's right, I could be absolutely wrong before this entire thing, but she was trying to get with someone before this, right? We never actually saw Marley and Sean ever get together. Once again, it's a little bit of a stretch and it could be easily wrong, okay? But if it is right, then it brings a whole lot to the table uh, for this story. Let's assume this is true. Let's assume that Marley didn't have a boyfriend beforehand but did afterwards. What does this mean? Well, it could imply that there are two Marleys. And it actually reminds me a lot of the story, The New Kid in which Kelsey basically gets spring-locked, uh, but wasn't Kelsey all along. Or maybe he was a duplicate. Or he never existed. It's difficult to tell with these stories. But that is why I am doubtful on this one. One thing I will say is that Marley definitely didn't make her way into the pizza, because if she did, then how come Peyton was the only one with the corrupted pizza when she fell into the actual pizza mix that was spread out to all the pizzas? We know the pizza that Peyton ate was just an illusion in her head. So I'm pretty sure that Marley didn't become part of the pizza mix at all. One thing I also want to add to this is that we know Abigail is a huge contrast to Marley. In fact, they're the exact opposite. She's presented as a quiet old friend who is in no way pushy and has a lot less popularity than Marley. The other thing about Abigail though, is that we know she hasn't changed after all of these years, or at least in Peyton's eyes, she hasn't changed. But if she's the opposite of Marley, then that would mean that Marley has changed 
quite literally. Okay, okay, let's just scrap all of that. Okay, whether you believe it or not, it's a weird theory, okay? I'm just putting out ideas. It's more of a conspiracy theory than a realistic FNAF theory with proof. Uh, but I do want to talk further about the parallel that we were talking about yesterday. And that parallel is the parallel between Peyton and Michael Afton. We already talked a lot about, uh, about Peyton possibly being a Michael parallel, while Marley, inside of her, in, <laughs> in inverted commas, uh, is an Ennard parallel. And I still actually believe that quite a bit. But let's remind ourselves, why did most of the things in this story happen? And the answer is best explained from a comment that I got on yesterday's video. Peyton is an unreliable narrator. She's going through trauma, she's going through her worst nightmare, and yet 95% of the story is through her perspective. We have to be careful, as readers, to question the credibility of the story as someone who is going through all of this. And I believe that this draws a huge parallel to FNAF 4. Peyton has nightmares. Nightmares that are extremely realistic and take place in her own house. The reason she has these nightmares is because of guilt. The hallucinations are driven by guilt. They get worse and worse by dread. It's even possible that guilt is a form of agony, um, creating these kind of nightmares, but that's just something to think about. In all of this, I do see FNAF 4, realistic nightmares in the form of animatronics horrors in her own house, horrors in Michael's own house. I really do think that Peyton is a parallel to Michael and that the story is a parallel to FNAF 4. Remember, it's basically already confirmed that we play as Michael in FNAF 4, based off of the drawing in the survival logbook, um, but this story I think further implies it. To finish, let's go one step further. Why do the nightmare animatronics exist? It's a question we've had for a very long time, but I think this story answers it with a very satisfying answer. They exist as a result of Michael Afton's guilt. After killing his younger brother, he feels guilty and the nightmares are created in his head. Night after night, the nightmares are getting worse and worse after he realizes what he's done. And at the end of the nightmare, what do we get? We find that the crying child is alive in a different form. In the form of Golden Freddy and possibly in the form of Nightmare Fredbear or Nightmare. This story tells the story of FNAF 4 and gives us reasoning as to why these animatronics exist. Just like how we found in what we found, uh, the Nightmare animatronics like the Phantom animatronics are hallucinations, probably as a result of agony. I would love to know what you believe uh, and what you think about this. What do you think the nightmares are? What do you think this story has to do with Michael Afton and FNAF 4? Do you think it is even a good parallel to make? Uh, let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear your opinion. Make sure you subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye!